High Point University presents A Conversation with Josh Groban and Nito Cobain is a production of UNC-TV in association with High Point University. Hello, I'm Nito Cobain, president of High Point University, and I welcome you to this program on this day. I'm delighted to introduce to you a wonderful human being known the world over, a multi-platinum songwriter and singer and performer admired by audiences on every continent on this globe. He is visiting with us at High Point University, and I get a chance to interview him here right now. Josh Groban, welcome to High Point University. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you're here. As you may know, every year at our convocation, uh, we end the convocation by having someone uh, who sings, somebody very talented, by the way. Yes. You should hear him. Yes. He's the head of our music I department. I know. I just met him backstage. Wonderful guy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. His name is Dr. Mark Foster, and he sings that song. Yes. And, I'm, and, I'm honored for that. And I hear you also have an eagle that flies over here. Yes, that we happens. have an eagle. Well, we'll listen, that is, I got to start doing that in my shows. I feel like... <laughs> Nobody cares if I miss a lyric if you know that the eagle is coming. That's, yes, the, yeah. eagle, the eagle will definitely be yeah. coming. So listen, you were, we got to get to know Josh Groban. You were born in Los Angeles. You yes. have one brother yeah. uh, younger than you called Chris. One younger brother. We have the same birthday four years apart. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got a younger brother on my fourth birthday, which was... Uh, <laughs> we're best friends now, but yes. at, at the time, that was not a cool day for me. <laughs> I was, yeah, I was expecting a clown party, and... Uh, <laughs> Or straight to the hospital. But yeah, I love, I love him to death. His name is Chris. Yep. Your mother was a teacher. Yep. Your father a business person. Yep. And how in the world did you end up being who you are? Well, both of my parents uh, loved the arts. Uh, I got my ear from my dad. He was a jazz trumpet player all through college, plays piano throughout the house, is always singing, and just has a great ear for music. His mom, you know, said to him at the time, you know, music is a very risky way to make a living. So. He also has a, a great business brain, and he went into uh, executive search. He's uh, what they call a headhunter and still doing that. My mom uh, taught uh, middle school visual art uh, in Los Angeles for many years and uh, kind of decided to put that to the side when my brother and I were born, but now uh, continues uh, her artistic um, experience with my arts foundation, uh, and she helps a lot with that as well. So the two of them were, were very, very much centered in the real world. You know, they weren't show parents at all. Growing up in Los Angeles, it's very easy to assume that maybe, you know, they, were, they pushed me out with a spinny bow tie and said, you know, off you go. But they actually weren't that way. They just exposed my brother and I to great art. And it was really our own decisions, because my brother directs. Uh, it was our own decisions to, uh, to go into it. I got the bug. And it was all because of that art exposure that they gave me when I was young. And it all, it all began with you singing at what age? Well, I mean, I, I sang early. I mean, I sang in my elementary school choir and um, sang, you know, really to myself. I was very shy about it. I was not, you know, I was, I was an introvert with a really big voice. And so I would just kind of lock my door and I would sing along to stuff and I would kind of gear up my own confidence. What would just you sing? Uh, I sang everything. I mean, I, it took me a while to, you know, find my voice, so to speak, you know, to find what my natural voice was, because I was also really good at imitating at a young age. I, would, I, could, I could listen to, you know, actors that I liked and singers that I liked, and I could just mimic them perfectly. So I, I would, you know, listen to, I was a, a kid in the 90s, so I was growing up with all the grunge rock bands, but at the same time I was listening to Placido Domingo and Mel Torme and Frank Sinatra and some of the great musical theater singers. Um, and I was trying to emulate emulate them, and, and what, what wound up feeling the most comfortable for me was kind of more of a traditional pop kind of sound. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I didn't start singing in front of people until seventh grade. It was a music teacher that pulled me out and had me sing by, uh, by force uh, in front of people. And, uh, Do you remember what the song was? Yeah, it was uh, a Swonderful, the Gershwin song. Oh. And great song, beautiful song. Um, I, uh, I tell the story sometimes, I'm gonna talk about it tomorrow as well, but um, I, I had a music teacher who, who pulled me out and he, he said, you know, well, he said, do you know how to scat sing? And I said, oh, scat sing, yeah, yeah. You know, that, you know making, up, making up words. My dad did it around the house, which is why I, I knew kind of what he was talking about. And so I kind of like did a little bit just joking around. He's like, that's perfect. I want you to do a scat solo and I also want you to sing this song, It's Wonderful. And it's gonna be for the cabaret show for all the students next week, good luck. 
and you know, I, I had a hard time making friends uh, because I was very shy. My voice had not changed yet, so I was a 13-year-old talking like this. <laughs> and so I was, I was shy about my voice, and I was shy certainly about putting myself out there. And this is why I'm such a proponent for arts education, because the assignment of that, uh, not wanting to let my teacher down, having the permission, because it was a class, to put myself out there that way was, was life-changing. Um, I went out, I sang my little boy soprano heart out, and, uh, and I got a standing ovation. It, it could have gone either way, but I, that night, I got a standing ovation. <laughs> kids, kids can be very cruel. Uh, thank God it was before social media. It went very well, and um, kids were giving me high fives the next day, and my mom and my dad you know, knew I spent a lot of time in my room, but they didn't know why. So they heard me singing for the first time, and I realized from that point forward that even if I didn't do it professionally, that music and singing needed to be a part of my life, that it was a, it was a language that I knew now I could communicate with, that it helped me express myself far better than, um, than communicating through language. And then, as you as you grew older, obviously you, you developed and you, you you mastered your craft and your your first your first big time was when. Well, I mean, I mentioned seventh grade. I mean, I was thirteen, going out in the in the choir for that, and I was signed at seventeen. So, I mean, there wasn't a lot of time between, um, you know, kind of agoraphobic kid to suddenly being thrown into a very professional spotlight. Um, and I was, but, but that moment in seventh grade eventually got my confidence. I started getting lead roles in the musicals. I started, um, you know, I, I went to, I eventually graduated from a, uh, an arts high school, public arts high school called Los Angeles County High School for the Arts, where I really found myself there. I, I, ran, I was with other kids that I connected with, other kids who really shared that, that point of light for arts and felt like they were kind of the, the outsiders at their prospective schools. And then we all kind of gathered at this art school and felt like we were all the weirdos together. And it was really a lot of fun. <laughs> but I was there and I was singing and singing on the side. And it was a voice teacher that I had in Los Angeles uh, that was contacted by uh, a producer, that, a friend of yours as well, a guy named David Foster, who has 16 Grammy Awards and basically you know, produced all the hits for Celine Dion and Whitney Houston and so many of the singers that I grew up idolizing. And he said, who have you got who's young, who can sing? And he sent in a tape of mine, and I was one of five, and he chose me. And the next thing I knew, I was singing for uh, the governor of California's inauguration for 25,000 people. Well, and well, that, that uh, was the song. It was, uh, that was All I Ask of You from Phantom of the Opera. So um, Michael Crawford was going to be on the show, and he got sick and pulled out. So he said, you know, I don't want anybody famous. Give me somebody who's just going to come and do it, and somebody young that, that I don't have to worry about. And. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he picked me, and so I, 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 you know, I sang my heart out and was just expecting this was a cool new thing. I couldn't believe where I was, but fully expecting I'd just go back to school, I'd be intolerable for a few days, and then I'd go right back to my work. <laughs> um, and it, it turned into far more than that. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself, and, um, and two weeks later he called me for a, a Grammy rehearsal with, with Celine, uh, and that was my first time really getting the attention of people within the business was... And what was that song? Well, uh, it was a song called The Prayer. Oh, sure. And he called me, uh, you know, I was still living at, at home, of course, and he calls, calls, you know, my house number, and David, what, you know, what can I do for you? He says, well, hey, I'm, uh, I'm in a jam. You know, again, I, I got very lucky because people couldn't show up. Yes. Like, that was like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... <laughs> You, you, you pray every day people get sick? Is there a famous <laughs> No, <people>? no. <laughs> I never gave in to that temptation. <laughs> but when serendipity has been on my side, yes. uh, I've, I've grasped the opportunity. Uh, so, so Andrea Bocelli, who was the original singer of this song, an extraordinary singer and wonderful guy, uh, he was, his flight was delayed. He was in Germany. He was doing a concert, couldn't make it on the flight. Celine was in LA. The Grammys were at the Shrine Auditorium in LA. David had this song. He said, I'm here, I'm with Celine. We need somebody who can sing it. I'm, I'm gonna fax you, we had fax back then. Uh, I'm gonna fax you the lyrics, I'm gonna send you the song, and, uh, uh, and if you can learn it, I need you, I need you here in, in you know, six hours. And you know, I'm listening to it, and I'm listening to Bocelli's voice, and you know, I'm a baritone, and Andrea's you know, got a Pavarotti-esque high, very high tenor. 
And I'm listening to these notes, and, and I'm going, hmm, that, that is, that, yeah, that's Italian. Yeah, that's Italian. Um, <laughs> yeah, good, good. <laughs> and um, so I'm, I, 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 was, I was terrified, and I just, I basically said to him, I, I don't think I can do this. I, I, this is, thank you, thank you for this opportunity, but I think this is a little out of my realm. Thank you, thank you, goodbye. And I, and I sat back and I was, I was equal parts relieved and so mad at myself that I had done that. And, you know, I told my parents and they're like, oh, oh, yeah, no, that yeah, sounds hard, yeah, okay. Yeah. Are you sure, are you sure you wanted to say no? I'm going, yeah, yeah, no, I've made up my mind. Ring, 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 he calls back again. He goes, yeah, I don't think you understood me. Uh, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you, get your ass over here. Uh, I'll see you, I'll see you at six o'clock. And that was it. I got the lyric out and I started writing the, you know, phonetically, trying to learn the Italian, and and I'm I'm you know tightening my pants to get the notes, and uh, I'm I I went out there absolutely shaking like a leaf. I'm out there. I'm standing on this X out on the Grammy stage, and they're going, "Where's this Josh Brogan? Bogan? Where's this, where's this guy?" I'm like, going, "Oh, you." All right, whatever. Stand there, and uh, Celine came out with her entourage, and I got air kisses. It was wonderful. Um, and she was so kind, so friendly. I couldn't believe how kind she was because she didn't have to be. You know, I'm a nobody. I'm out there. I'm a teenager. I'm a fill-in singer. I'm a stand-in. And, and she immediately, because she's so in tune with people, it's what makes her a great artist, she could see that I was in my head. She could see that I was swimming in anxiety. And so she, she said, to, you know, she, she takes my hand. She goes, for this first run through, let's hold hands for this one. Let's hold hands for this song, you know? I'm thinking, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm out there and I'm singing with her and she just keeps squeezing my hand and the notes came out and the, the you know, the Italian was, was 80% but enough. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so, and, and it was an amazing moment. It was one of those moments where just like that teacher, I felt like I had someone who really pushed me through the doubt and said, I'm not asking you. This is your assignment. I believe in you and you can do this. And, you know, cut to, you know, a few years later when I eventually got a record deal, that song played a huge part in my life. I eventually recorded that song on my first record. I sang it at the closing ceremonies of the Winter Olympics. Um, Ten, I sang it with Celine on her TV special on CBS. And, I, and then 10 years after I sang it for that Grammy rehearsal, I sang it with Andrea on the actual Grammys 10 years later. So it, it's amazing how those moments that you think of as, ah, I better say, ah, I don't know, thank you, but ah, I don't know. They just, you, you decide to say yes to something like that. You push yourself through that thing and go for the ride, even if everything in your body is saying, this is gonna be really hard. And it can change your entire life. You know, you never know. And certain, some things, uh, it's the opposite. Some things you 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 know go into and expect a lot of things from it. You expect it, and this is if it never happens. But and the lesson that you extracted from that is what the lesson for students, for young people who are trying to start out in life and who have anxiety and fear and that anticipation. I think, I think that you, you learn to you learn to to gauge what is good fear and what is bad fear. And that's something that comes from experience. I didn't have that experience back then. So for me, any kind of fear was, I don't know if I wanna be part of this. You learn as you put in your hours, when it's the kind of fear that makes you say, it's like a burn on your skin, you go, mm, that's bad fear. Mm, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be brave enough to say no to this. And when it's the kind of fear that is actually energy churning, it's the kind of fear that is because you want it so much, and the kind of fear that, that you know you can do it, but, you, but because you want it so much, you might just really fail and hurt yourself badly mentally because you failed at it. And that's the kind of fear that you learn is the good stuff. That's the kind of fear and the anxiety that you can then harness into an energy that's an excitement, it makes you wanna work hard, it makes you wanna just visualize the success of it and go for it. And it doesn't always work out. Sometimes nerves play a part even when you're 37 and I've done this for 15 years. But the lesson I learned from those experiences and anybody who's been lucky enough to have a teacher or a mentor uh, or a parent or a, whatever it is that has um, believed in you when you haven't believed in yourself and pushed you when you wouldn't have pushed yourself. And then, you, and then you know, what do you know? You actually get through it. 
And that's a sense memory experience that you then keep with you. That's a muscle that you've then started to work for any other experience you have after that that feels uh, trepidatious and nervous. You know then you can do it. You know you can get through it, or at least you know you have the tools to do your best. So that's what, that's what I gained from it. And, and those early moments truly um, shaped a huge amount of decision making for me over the course of you know, nine more albums. Let us in on uh, what does a day in the life of Josh Groban look like? Josh uh, Groban, the professional. Right. What does that look like? Do you practice every day? How do you keep your voice in tune and active and alive and unharmed? Uh, do you have a coach with whom you work? Um, assuming you're not preparing for a specific concert or show, what does that look like? Well, um, singing, singing is an interesting uh, thing to, to keep working on because your instrument is inside you. So it's attached to your body, it's attached to your physiology, it's attached to your anxiety, it's attached to your brain, it's attached to your breath, it's attached to so many things that play a part in whether or not you're gonna sing well. If I were playing another instrument, of course those things are also attached, you have to you know, be relaxed and be ready and prepared. But then you can polish it and you can put it away and have a drink. Mm -hmm. um, with singing, and also because your mouth is here and your ears are here, and you're hearing things in your skull differently than other people are hearing you, it's very easy to micromanage and it's very easy to self-criticize in the moment of singing, which is something you work very hard not to do. Uh, so, so most of the things that I gear myself up for singing-wise are mental, you know. Um, we're very superstitious. Uh, I sacrifice a live goat every morning. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Not to that. I, um, I try and get a full night's sleep. Some, some of it's really simple. I mean, honestly, because we're all so crazy as singers, it's very easy to get stuck in routines that are unnecessary. So like eight hours of sleep, lots of water, and try to do 15 minutes, 20 minutes of warm-ups as often as I can. I do work with a coach. I'll never stop working with a coach because it's important to have somebody that can listen outside of you and listen for bad habits, listen for things that you're getting in your own head about. Um, and I think it's always important to have that. Um, and it's, it's a sport, you know? If I have a concert to get, tour to get ready for, I get a lot of exercise, I do a lot of running, I get my breath going. Um, and then I just try to listen to as much as possible. I try to listen to what's out there and I try to um, get inspired by other artists and other singers um, as often as I can. And in a month you're gonna be co-hosting the Tony Awards yeah. at, um, in New York? Yes, yeah. That uh, was a huge surprise to get that call. Um, my relationship with the Tonys has been You're has gonna been do that in English wonderful. or Italian? Uh, you know, we'll see. <laughs> Gibberish, if I'm nervous enough. Um, I, I got a call to do that uh, a, couple, uh, a few weeks ago, and um, I'm gonna be co-hosting with the wonderful Sarah Bareilles, who's been a friend for a long, long time, and a brilliant writer, and she wrote the, all the music to Waitress and then starred in it, and we kind of come from very similar backgrounds as far as our, we come from more of a pop music side, but at the same time, theater and the arts kind of played such a huge role in how we developed as performers. So. Um, and we both kind of came to the Tonys at the same time. She for Waitress, me for a show I did, I was nominated last year for a show called Great Comet of 1812, which I had a great time doing. And, uh, you know, hosting is something I haven't done a whole lot of. I, I've, I've, I've done it, um, you know, periodically. I did, did a network uh, music TV show that, that was just one summer. But, um, you know, it's a big responsibility. So that's, that's a perfect example of one of those just say yes moments mm. <laughs> where, you know, you say to yourself, eh, Okay, yeah, no, that's the good energy. That's the good fear. Say yes to that. Go, go do it, and then work hard at it. So we're, we're currently getting ready for that, and that'll be a lot of fun. So how do you prep for that? This is going to be on CBS, so yep. when, um, when I watch you on CBS that night emceeing that show, I will know what, that you have practiced how many days, how many hours, you're memorizing everything, you're reading everything on a teleprompter. Um, oh, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's one of those things where the, uh, the broad stroke ideas come from, from a very long time. We're starting now, we started last week. We're coming up with ideas, coming up with song ideas, opening ideas, costume change ideas, things that would be funny with the audience. You know, we, we start to throw ideas around about how to keep the show moving, it's a long show. And it's not just us, you got tons of performances, tons of presenters. How do we best, you know, keep the show moving along and stay true to ourselves? You know, how do we find an energy that is very 
you know, me and Sarah. Um, and then I think, that, I think that from what I've been told from other hosts that I've talked to about shows like this, Corden and people like that, is that um, you know, it's a sprint to the finish, that in the final week before and even on the final day, in the final couple of days, you know, script changes happen, things happen, you do a dress run for people, somebody doesn't laugh, you change that. And so it's gonna be, it's gonna be crazy. Luckily, because I was part of a, a nominated show last year, I know what that craziness feels like as far as gearing up for the show. On the day that the Tonys were last year, we had a show that day. We, we had a matinee, so I show up at the theater, we did our show, we then change into tuxes at the dressing room of our theater, we then take buses to the Tonys, we do the red carpet in our tuxes, we run backstage, change into our costumes and makeup again, do our performance on the Tonys, immediately wipe off our makeup, put on our tuxes, get back in time just for the, the, the awards to be announced. So that was, a, that was a sprint too, and then we had a show uh, the, the next day. So, um, you know, I'm no stranger, it's again, it's, that, it's, that, it's that, uh, that muscle. Once you feel like you've been through that craziness, you kind of realize you, you're, you're capable of it, and so it's, it's gonna be crazy. So I'm, I'm curious to know a couple of things about um, the life of a musician. Uh, for example, when you um, sing live at a concert, let's say, or performance, do you get nervous if the crowd is larger, or do you feel more energy if the crowd is larger? I am one of those people that gets more nervous if the crowd is smaller. If I can see every, if I can see the whites of everybody's eyes, <laughs> you know, and I can see, and I can see like the one guy. <laughs> um, that's that's Jeff, the security guy. <laughs> oh, hey guy. Jeff, hey man, how are you, man? Sitting right there. Yeah. Yes. But if he's not doing that, then I'm worried. You know, yes. he's he's he laser focused. This guy. Um, <laughs> anyone other than him? Uh, yeah. No. I mean, if it's just an abyss of people, yes. then it's easier for you to zone out, zen zen out, and just focus on 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 reaching the back of that space. What is the largest audience you've ever sung before? Um. Uh, the Olympics, for example? Uh, the Olympics was big, but probably not as big as President Obama's inauguration concert. That was about a million people uh, in person. Uh, so looking out on that from the Lincoln Memorial uh, and seeing just, I mean, yeah, that's, I would say that's a size that, that brings the nerves right on back. Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, when, the sea, when the sea of people just doesn't end, it's like an infinity pool of people. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty incredible, and, and everybody was waving American flags, and it was just, it was just a, um, you know, wow. <laughs> that's an interesting ringtone. <laughs> that's a, you have a call from. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so I, I, uh, I think that, probably, that was probably the biggest, yeah. Have you ever been in a situation where you're singing live and the words escaped you? Oh, sure. Yeah, it's our worst nightmare. Uh, when I get nervous, the words are the first thing to go. Melodies are, are rock solid for me. It's the words that somehow I lose them. Um, I, you know, I, I wound up, you know, after that rehearsal with Bocelli, I wound up, you know, feverishly studying singing in many different languages. So, you know, since then I've rec recorded in, you know, French, you know, Italian, Spanish, Japanese. Um, but so, so sometimes when you're when you're singing in those other languages, sometimes the some, you get, if you're, you're nervous or you're tired, or you've been doing a tour for 100 you're days. You're saying in Japanese because you wanted to or David Foster No, made I wanted you? to, I wanted to, oh. I, I wanted to. I, I, took, uh, I took Japanese in high school, so I, I had wanted, there was a song that I wanted to sing. And so, but I did, I did, there was one concert I remember where I was singing in Italian and, um, and uh, two things happened. Uh, I forgot one of the lyrics and just kind of started gibberishing the words. And then I burped. <laughs> Yeah, it was a, a one-two punch of embarrassment. Uh, I, you know, you start to, you, you talk about prepping for singing. When you start a tour, when people are parents, they say that like they're first born, they get like the most expensive diapers and the finest crib and all that stuff. And then once you have a second kid or a third kid, it's just like paper towels and pins and you know, it's hand-me-downs and things like that. When I start a tour, I am on it. I get up every morning, I drink my tea, I do my workout, I do my voice thing. And, if, and every show that I get through, I think, whew, got through that, good job, guys. You know, when you're on a long tour that lasts a year, a year and a half, sometimes two years, and you're on concert 90 or whatever, you know, you start to, you start to 
just kind of go, ah, oh, is it time for the show? Okay. <laughs> and I had, I had had a burger and a, and a big old 7-Eleven cup of Mountain Dew. <laughs> and, because uh, I wanted it, you know? It's show 90. And, uh, and I'm in Peoria. So, uh, and I just downed that thing. And uh, it came back. It came back. <laughs> yeah. So it's those moments that just kind of, no, Groban, get back in shape. <laughs> yeah. Have they invited you back to Peoria? Oh, yes. Chance? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were delighted. Uh, they were delighted. No, the good, the good news was uh, the burp was just loud enough so that uh, those of us on stage with monitors could hear it clear as a bell. My entire band and orchestra were, were cracking up. And, uh, and the audience was just like, that, I, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, they thought, they thought it, was, a, they thought it was, was me being passionate or something. Yeah, yeah. So how many, uh, how many albums have you sold? 30 million yeah, more? About, yeah. 30 million? I think, yeah. What do you do with all the cash? <laughs> well, it's uh, gold bouillon under my mattress. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, what did I do with all the cash? I'm save, saving it, saved it, you know? I, uh, you know, you learn, you learn by watching around you uh, how quickly this business can make you a hero to a zero. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, I was very lucky very early on to have a, a great deal of success and was certainly very lucky to have been in the music business at a time when records were still being sold, you know, you could sell, you could still sell six, seven, eight million mm -hmm. records for one one album, and you know now the number one selling album of the year will be one or two million. But um, uh, but it's you know I have been very fortunate. I've got parents that you know taught my brother and I great values and taught us about giving back and taught us about being you know not counting our chickens before they hatch. And and if it weren't for them and growing up with a lot of teacher people you know and teachers, David Foster being one of them, people that really taught me about how to handle money early on and how to not make the mistakes that a lot of other artists have had where you just, you think you see um, this enormous amount of success and you don't see how much is being overspent and how much is being wasted and, and all that stuff. So, um, so I've, been, I've, been, I've been pretty fortunate to um, have had a lot, of, um, a lot of good mentors when it comes to finances and things like that. But, uh, but a lot of it, a lot of it um, you know, honestly, the, the greatest gift for me of, of being on a on a pedestal where I'm at is having the foundation, being able to put some of that money into philanthropy has been, uh, has been a great I'm gonna great ask you about the foundation sure. in a couple of minutes. Um, you tell a story about being in the city of Milwaukee and you're on stage oh, yeah. and your voice decided to be in a different city. Sure did. At the same time. Yep. Tell us that story. Unexpectedly. You know, you think, you think as a singer, you know, you do your warm ups in the dressing room and it's all there, you know? You've got a good amount of time, if your voice is not behaving, to either realize you're getting sick and act accordingly, or to get it where it needs to be. Every morning, you take a hot shower and you do your and you go, okay, where am I today? How do I have to get from that to a bow? And, um, and that's the life of a singer. Every day, you wake up and you say, where am I at? How do I gotta go? And look, there, a famous opera singer, I forgot who it was, said, you know, we have eight perfect vocal days a year, and you just hope that one of them is on stage. And, you know, some days you wake up and you're just riding that wave. Everything you want to do is just there, and it doesn't take a lot of effort. Those are fun days, but they're very few and far between. Um, but on this particular day, uh, I was feeling fine. I was really feeling okay. You know, I, uh, I'd had, uh, you know, had good warm-ups, good sound check, and third song, voice just gone. Just decided literally to, gone. Literally gone. Big arena, fifteen thousand people. You were singing and nothing came out. Nothing came out. Not even a burp. No, not even a burp. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I would have been happy for any noise at that point. Um, and so a couple things go go through your head uh, besides holy crap. And uh, I was thinking to myself, you start going, okay, okay, what's going? First of all, what's going? What's wrong with me? And then. You think to yourself, I've got 15 more songs to sing. I've got another hour and a half, two hours mm -hmm. to fill time. When that happens at the beginning of a show, you know, you don't know what to do. So I, um, I, I did what felt like just the biggest white flag, worst thing to possibly do. But I just, I timed out. And I just said to the audience in a whisper, basically, 
I don't know what's going on. I've essentially, it's like a dancer who sprained their ankle. I need a minute. And if you'll, and I said, I said I could do two things. I could lip sync the rest of the show. No, boo. <laughs> uh, I could stop the show. No, 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 no. Or I could take 15 minutes and I could, and if you'll still be here, I'll be right back. So I stopped the show. And I went backstage and luckily somebody that I work on my voice with happened to be on tour with me at that moment. And, um, and I, just, I just drank tons of fluids and I slowly, slowly, slowly just started to do some very light vocal exercises and found it again. It came back. I, I, what I wound up realizing was that it was an allergic reaction to something I'd had to drink, it was some shake or something that I'd had right before I went on stage. Somebody had said, hey, you want this? And there was hemp in it or something. There was something in it that, that affected or a, a cashew nut or something that affected my throat and it just closed up. But I, I worked it back, I worked it back. And talk about getting back on the bike, walking back out to, luckily all 15,000 people were still there. And slowly getting the confidence because, you know, there's so much psychology. I was meeting with a, with a, a student backstage and they were studying, you know, psychology and music. And there's so much psychology to singing confidence, you know, it's like, it is like a figure skater going up and is the blade going to hit the ice? And so just having the, the confidence to say after that happening, you know, because people are paying for the notes, they're paying for you to sing out, are, are you going to go for it? You know, do you go for it? And slowly but surely it just kind of all started coming back and finished the show. I was expecting a horrible review and the reviewer didn't even mention it. So those moments too teach you a lot about what what you're able to come back from, and that it's okay to be human. You know, it's okay to say, I don't know why I'm not feeling like a machine today, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a very human time out and figure out what's going on. So what we say to our students here, you will fail, it doesn't mean that you're a failure. Correct. Uh, what was the song, do you remember? Well, it was, uh, yes, it was a song called Oceano. It was another Italian one. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, that particular tour, I was starting with a very hard song. And, uh, and it was one of those songs where uh, just by, you know, by the middle of the song, I felt it kind of wavering. And by the second song, it was just, you know, no bueno. So, um, yeah, yeah. And every time I go back to Milwaukee, I just, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> come on, no shakes. So in, uh, in uh, 2017, you were walking your dog uh, out in. You in, have done your research, my friend. Yeah, wow. So I, <laughs> trust me, I'm not going to. Tell their listener and viewer everything I know, so you're safe with me. Oh, wow. Can you think of a city or a concert hall in which you performed that you found yourself then telling all your friends <laughs> that was the moment of all moments? Oh, um, there, have been, there have been a few that, that are, you know, just pinch me, bucket list things. Playing Madison Square Garden for the first time was incredible. Um, playing a hometown venue like the Hollywood Bowl with my parents in the audience after being taken there since I was three years old is a really fun moment. Um, we've, had, we've had shows where we didn't know what to expect. You know, we went to South Africa on my first tour. I've gone back as often as I can. You go to a place so far away from home and to see the reaction to the music being exactly the same, if not more. How about another performer you have uh, performed with that was spectacular, memorable, uh, most meaningful for you. Celine holding your Celine hand, of course. Celine holding my hand. Um, you know, uh, singing with Aretha Franklin was uh, in incredible. Um, she is someone that... What did that you sing with her? I sang with her. Um, we, sang, uh, we sang You Raise Me Up together, actually, as a matter of fact. And she wanted to sing it with me, and we did it for Nelson Mandela's birthday concert at Radio City Music Hall in New York. And that's just a master class, really. You're just there as a student, you know? Yes, technically I had a mic, I was, yes, I was making noise. But when you're singing with someone like Aretha, you're just, you're just there to listen, really, you know? <laughs> the, rest, the rest is just, just filler. And, uh, and so, you know, we had rehearsed in her dressing room. She was so great, she's listening to the song, and we're talking about, you know, what verses we're gonna take, and we had it all planned out, but the brilliant thing about Aretha is just, you just, when her mic goes up, your mic just, take your mic down. It's just, <laughs> when she decided to sing, that was it. I just put my mic and I would just watch her like a hawk, and as soon as that mic would start doing this, I'd, all right, I'll take it from there. 
and um, yeah, that was a that was a really that was a really special one for me. Okay, yeah, you uh, sang at the Nobel Prize ceremony. Yeah, a long time ago. That had to be special. It was. Yeah, that was in Norway. Describe it to us. What does that look like? Who was there? What did you sing? Why did they ask you? Um, <laughs> so. And did you did you did you burp? And no, I didn't burp. I didn't burp. Uh, why does anyone ever ask me is a question that I don't, will, will never stop asking myself. Um, but uh, the, the, the night itself was really, was really great. Um, they were honoring Jimmy Carter that year. Um, incredible lineup of singers. Carlos Santana was there. The great opera singer Jesse Norman was there. Um, and, uh, and little old me. And it was a, a beautiful ceremony. Anthony Hopkins hosted it. Um, and yeah, to be a part of something like that, to be a, a part of something that was so um, uniting and celebrated the best in us uh, was, was a thrill. It was in a big arena uh, called, uh, I think, the Spectrum in Oslo. And uh, yeah, it was a beautiful night. And what did you sing? The prayer. <laughs> yeah, it all comes around. Yeah, yes. that was uh, not long after that had happened with Andrea at the Grammy rehearsals. Uh, and I had released that first album. Uh, they, they asked me to sing that song with a, a wonderful singer named Sissel, who's a great opera singer in, uh, in Norway. And um, yeah, that was a very fitting song for that night. And you act. Yeah, sometimes. On Netflix <laughs> and other places yeah, too. Yeah. What, I, uh, got, what got you into acting and which do you like more, acting or singing? You know, music has always been my first love. And I think that when it comes down to it, that will always be my day job. Uh, I, I started acting because, you know, the fork in the road with David Foster was, would you like to have a record deal? And it was an opportunity to learn something new and to take that opportunity to run with it, to say, okay, yes, this could be incredible. I could learn a lot from this. And that has taken over my life. But my original dream, the reason I was at Carnegie Mellon for, for theater was because I loved the acting and the singing together. I loved the storytelling of the combination of music, music and theater, which, is, which was my bug early on. I would sit in the audience and watch, you know, Sondheim and Andrew Lloyd Webber and Les Mis and that kind of stuff, and I'd say, I wanna, I wanna do that, I wanna tell those stories. So the acting was, was a part of it early on. And then the first five years of my recording career, I really only just did the music. And then slowly I started kind of getting random offers from people. I would get calls from friends that were on shows like, you know, The Office and, and things like that. And, and, Parks and Rec, and I do these little cameos, some of them silly, some of them just playing myself. Um, but my first professional gig was really on a show called Ally McBeal. Uh, David E. Kelly heard part of my first album before it came out. I was gonna be the wedding singer. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. and Calista Flockhart were gonna get married at the end of the season finale. I was gonna sing 30 seconds. It was gonna be the greatest time of my life. I was, I was 17, 18. And, um, I don't know if you guys remember, but that was a time period. Now, of course, Robert Downey Jr. is absolutely crushing it, and he's been sober and all that. But at that time, there were some things going on with him that were in his personal life that were, um, that were um, not so great. And he was arrested and couldn't show up to film the episode. So David E. Kelly, um, yeah, again, another person that couldn't show up. I, this is like there's a theme. <laughs> I am the luckiest SOB on the planet. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, um, so your, your career is basically built on the misery of I others? I really, <laughs> gosh, now that I think about it. Do you feel guilty about I'm this? Gonna rewrite, you... I'm gonna rewrite my whole speech tomorrow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I've become friends with all these people since then, which is, which is great. But um, David E. Kelly said, you know, can you act? And I'm saying, well, I was, I was just Tevye and Fiddler on the Roof in my senior school, excuse senior production. <laughs> All right, great. So he, so he changed my role from a 30-second singing role to being the lead character of that entire episode. That was one of the first things I ever did. But, um, but back to more recently, uh, you know, I've, I've done some film, done some TV. I got a call from a great guy named Andy Breckman who created a show called Monk, which I loved. And he said, I've got this new show for Netflix called The Good Cop. I've watched your stuff. I've watched your interviews. And I thought of you when I wrote this character. Will you do it? And... That was another fork in the road. I was in the, I, this was just, you know, nine months ago. Uh, I was recording. I've been recording to make the next record and put that out. And I was talking to my manager about it. I said, this is a door that's unexpected, that's opened. I'm getting the good fear. I'm getting that good thing. Can I do it? I don't know, but I want to, I want to say yes. And so I went for it. And so this whole last four or five months, I've been filming this new show that'll be out uh, 
uh, sometime. Uh, sometime. Netflix is very, they don't want me to say anything, but uh, it'll, be out, it'll be out soon, probably the fall. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and it was a blast, an incredible cast. I play this kind of anal retentive homicide detective who only plays by the rules. My father, uh, my father in the show, um, is played by Tony Danza, and he, uh, who's, who's a blast and so good, so good in this, and such a great mentor for all of us on set, and obviously a legend in, in his world. And, um, and, uh, and he plays the most corrupt cop in history, uh, who happens to be my father, and so I'm living with him as part of his parole rules. And, um, and each episode, each episode is a new mystery, kind of, you know, fun, Family friendly in the in the style of like Columbo. It's every episode is a whodunit with these crazy crimes, and it was just a blast. Every episode was uh, was uh, you know an, a new way to kind of uh, to kind of uh, make the make the ten year old kid in me happy with all the uh, chasing bad guys running around. That's great. The uh, co-founder of Netflix is named Mark Randall. Yeah, he's had a great history here. Yes, yeah. he's, uh, we have a number of those. He's our entrepreneur in residence at yeah. High Point. Yeah. As uh, Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computer, is our That's entrepreneur right. in residence, and we have a dozen of those yeah. who have had uh, an indelible uh, impact in our world, and, and in, in Netflix case, they've changed the whole way we watch television. They have. Yeah. Uh, so what about regrets? You're only 37, yes? Mm -hmm. So you haven't had time to learn how to spell the word regret, Oh, yeah, right? I have. Sure. I mean, you know, when you get thrown into the big leagues young, you know, you're, you're um, you know, the, the, the opportunities for regret are start early, you know? And uh, so, you know, I, 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 I'm very grateful for, to have had that opportunity. That was my path. But... I really missed out on the, especially in the college experience, uh, the chance to um, make mistakes kind of within a safe, you know, safety net. Uh, any mistakes that I made were in the public eye, were in front of an audience. And, um, and so I was, I was learning as I was out there trying to be the best next thing, I was inside thinking to myself, I don't know anything. You know, I, I have, I was, you know, I was a young 13-year-old and I was a young 17-year-old. I, I, I emotionally was young. And so, um, you know, you start, you, you start to kind of move at a snail's pace socially and emotionally and while your professional skills and things like that are, are, are skyrocketing. And so, you know, you and I were talking backstage a lot about balance, the importance of balance. And because... It was go, go, go from the beginning for me. Learning about balance was something that took me a long time to figure out. Making time for the things that aren't just ambition, that aren't just validation. Uh, making time for, you know, important relationships, uh, you know, whether they be friends or romantic or otherwise. Really using the same muscles you use to, to hone your professional skills, using those muscles to hone your, your connections in life that means something to you. And so, you know, I have regrets creatively, you know, but you move on, you move on from those. The good news is, you know, if you're, if you're striving for something great, people sometimes don't remember, you know, the, the missteps in your work. You know, if, if, you did, if you do something nobody wants to see or hear, nobody sees and hears it. You move on to the next thing. And that's the good news. Um, you know, for all the things you do that people weren't interested in, when you do something that they are interested in, people take notice and they remember you for that. So, you know, you just you just learn through those to to pick yourself up, and that's the real that's the real challenge is through your regrets, through your failures. The hard part is deciding to get back and do it again because in those moments, you, you it becomes very myopic. You think it's it all you know it all revolves around that that particular moment of self-doubt and, you know, and, um, and self-criticism. But, uh, you know, I'm sure I'll have more regrets in the future, but, but I, I, I feel very lucky that I've had a good team around me. You want to surround yourself with people that you can bounce yourself off of during those darker moments that, that help you get back up, as, as you do to other people who need you as well. 
So at Hyper University, we, um, we claim and proclaim that we are premier life skills school. Yeah, I've, I've, I've really um, been so impressed in the more I've learned about the school, how much that plays a part in the education side because so many schools and so much that's taught is really, is really all about turning people into success machines when it comes to um, you know, how cutthroat it is out there. And we gotta prepare people to be even more cutthroat than the next person, you know, and how to climb that wall. But the, top, the secret is that when you make time for the things that give you balance in your life, for the things that recharge your soul, you actually put out much more inspired work. You connect with people on a deeper level in your work. And, um, and so, I, 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 to that point, I'm, I, I think that's, that's wonderful because um, when I've been, when I've made um, the least aware um, choices in my professional life, uh, they've been when my insides were a little empty mm -hmm. and I was wound up so tight uh, with the stress of ambition that I didn't think clearly about the connection. And so, um, no, I think it's just as important and a brave thing to do, yeah. Well, you know, today, uh, if you're graduating students who are not prepared for an ever-changing, ever-competitive uh, global marketplace, yep. then they're only trained, they're not fully educated. Yep. And we tell our students that we want them to have a life filled with success. Yep. You've had a life filled with success. Sure. But that life must be framed with significance. Yeah. That uh, the two most important words in the English language are influence and impact. Mm -hmm. You influence people, you impact the world. When you do that, you have joy in your heart. Mm -hmm. You do it with music, you do it with acting, you do it with your life, your life lessons, with your regrets and so on. Christmas songs is something you like a lot and you've recorded a lot of Christmas carols. I've recorded less than you would think. Uh, but that, that particular I album... Bought, I that, only bought you Christmas carols. That, uh, that, that album did very well. Uh, <laughs> I, um, yeah, and, and, uh, and, and, so, and so I wound up singing those songs uh, a lot. I grew up with that music. I grew up with these songs. They're some of the most beautiful songs I've ever written. And of course, any time you get to sing those songs with a big orchestra and the organ and all that stuff, it's, uh, it was great. I, I did that Christmas album as a side project. I had some fans who said, you know, we would really love a Christmas album from you. Now everybody's doing Christmas albums. At the time that I recorded it, having a, a Christmas album in the top 10 on Billboard was like unheard of. It was like a separate chart where people go, oh, that's nice. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, I recorded it and we realized we were kind of onto something special while we were listening to it. We just got goosebumps, we said, this is, this is great. And, um, you know, when Oprah says, this is my favorite thing, uh, <laughs> doesn't hurt. <laughs> So <laughs> it became a very big album. It became the number one album of that year in any category, actually. And, uh, and, so, um, and so, you know, like I said, when you have those, those successes, that's when you do something that means something to you and, and really connects with people, that's what people remember. Yeah. Tell us about your foundation, Find Your Light mm -hmm. Foundation. What is it? Why did you start it? What does it do? I was uh, doing a concert at the Greek Theater in Los Angeles gosh, almost 10 or 11 years ago now. And some fans came to the front of the stage. They had one of those jumbo checks, you know, and they said, oh, stop the show, stop the show. I'm going, oh, God, what do we got? What are we, what's going on? I, I could have used you at that moment. That, that was really, uh, you know. um, I was like, yes, 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 whoa, whoa, whoa. what is it? And they said, well, they took the mic and they said, we've taken your autographs over the last many years. We've taken memorabilia. We've put them all on eBay. And I'm thinking, that's not very nice. <laughs> They said, no, 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 we've put it on eBay, we've sold them, and we're giving the money back to you, and we want you to start a foundation. And I was floored. The whole, my whole band and I were just looking around like, is this really happening? You know, the most generous fans, the most incredible philanthropic fans, they knew through David, through David Foster, um, how many, uh, you know, charitable events I had sung at and how many I'd like, to, I'd like to get involved with. And so they said, start a foundation. And so we finished the concert, and I called my parents, and I'm thinking, what do we do? We can't just ignore that. We have to do something. So, you know, so I threw a foundation together. I called it the Josh Groban Foundation. It was an umbrella organization. It gave a little bit to a lot of, or a lot of places. And it was very satisfying, but we were also just chipping away at a lot of different places. I, I um, about five, six years later, I was asked to testify to Congress on the importance of the arts and the importance of arts education. 
And in doing that, I realized, oh, I've got a lot of experience with this. I, I come from a public arts background. My mom was a public arts teacher. In many ways, I felt very saved by an arts education. And certainly, I've seen around me how the arts have saved lives. And so in making that case to uh, a bunch of you know, very stiff congressmen and women who knew, knew already what they were going to put in the budget for the arts, um, I realized you know, this is something I, I know a lot about. This could be my silver bullet when it comes to philanthropy. And so I made the conscious decision that I would still give to all those organizations. I would still support them, sing at their events, whatever. But that my foundation, I felt my bigger impact could be something that I really know very well and something that um, I, knew, I knew a little bit would go a long way in changing a lot of young people's lives. So um, I, I also wanted to take my name off of it because it just seemed indulgent and I don't know, I felt like that's, that's something for another time. But so I changed it to the Find Your Light Foundation and the message of it was about making sure that, uh, and we're just starting in the US but we'd like it to go worldwide at some point, that every young person has the opportunity and the access to a solid arts education, whether they go into it professionally or not. We're not looking for superstars. We are looking for those opportunities to find programs that are always falling through the cracks, especially now, um, that give kids a chance to be leaders through the arts, to sh share their voices through the arts, to be confident sometimes for the first time through the arts. Because the studies have shown that graduation rates go up, grades go up, home life becomes better. You have kids with behavioral problems who really were just in need of a way to express themselves, who go from the back of the class and getting into fights to the front of the class raising their hand wanting to be the class leader, all because they had arts ed. So that's Find Your Light, and we've had an amazing time. We're on our third gala now this year, and we've raised millions, and, um, and we're, uh, we're, we're fledgling, but we're continuing to, to, to do that. So that's, that's something that I've had a lot of fun doing. I congratulate you for doing that, for Thanks. changing the world in your own way, and well, for you. sharing the goodness that's come your way. Thank you. Appreciate and uh, this is what we say at Hyper University. We are in the business of planting seeds of greatness in the hearts, minds, and souls of our students. Absolutely. That's essentially what you're doing in the Absolutely. hearts and souls of others. Well, thank you for doing this. You know, I told you that uh, at the end of each convocation at Hyper University, um, we we have a very talented person on our faculty uh, sing You Raise Me Up. Yes. And I actually, it's part of my presentation, part of my speech, and I end by quoting you. I said, and, and in the words of um, the song that Josh Groban made so famous, and then I read some of the words, when I am down and all my soul so weary, when troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. And then I um, have him sing the song. And then I end with this last paragraph or last verse, which gets every mom in the crowd to cry. <laughs> Would you read that last verse? <laughs> and this do right it here? melodiously if you can. <laughs> yes. You want me to read it? Well. It's your thing. <laughs> I, self, I set myself up for that one. I, uh... You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You know, you didn't need to hand this to me. I've sung this a few times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're a champion to do that. <laughs> My, pleasure. Um, My pleasure. You know, Josh, I have to tell you that um, I have done a lot of research on you. Mm. I know about your background. I know about your faith. 
I know about your character. I know about your foundation. And the reason we wanted you to be at High Point University is because in so many ways, in so many ways, you suggest loudly and with great clarity that when you are passionate about something and when you are determined to do it well, you truly become a valuable and relevant citizen in our society. And in so many ways, that's who you are. You are a relevant and valuable citizen of our society to whom God has given such tremendous talent as you just demonstrated on the spot without an orchestra. <laughs> and, and I think that there's a lesson in that for all of us. It doesn't matter how old we are, what our backgrounds are, who we are, where we've been. The reality of it is each of us is endowed with gifts from the heavens. And some of us use them better than others. You have used your gifts in marvelous and wondrous ways. I'm proud to have you on the campus of Hypo University, call you a friend, and invite you back in again. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Josh Grove. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.